Okay, 7.4 example one. This is where we start to look at the actual behavior of looking at this function. And I would just like to quickly write out what these are. So the function that they want us to work with in this example is f of x is equal to x. And this does confuse a lot of students that they feel like this f should be a variable or something. It's not. It's just so we can talk about, you know, function f and then the reciprocal of that function. Um, and if that is function f, then 1 over f of x can be written as 1 over x. Now, it is important that if you want to do this on your calculator, we would make y1 equal to x and y2 equal to 1 over x. And in the context of this question, this would be our function and this would be the reciprocal of that function. And that's a really handy thing because if you know how to type this into your calculator, then if nothing else, you're going to have a really, really handy and accurate visual aid for solving this problem. Now, the best way I think to examine this is to actually look at a table of values, which is a nice way of kind of summarizing what's happening in the actual graph itself. So again, just to highlight exactly what we're talking about here, um, in blue on the graph is f of x, and in red on the graph, is 1 over f of x. And I actually just put that blue writing in the wrong spot. Um, this is f of x. And hopefully it's pretty clear that we can see what's happening to these points. Now, um, I, I do want to point out that negative 10 comma negative 10 is on the graph, uh, our blue graph. And unfortunately, it's a little bit low, but it's right here. That's our negative 10 comma negative 10 point. And if we look up at the red graph, the red graph has the point negative 10 comma negative 1 over 10. And it's really important that that's all the reciprocal is doing. It's, it's taking whatever the output, the y value of the original function was or is, and it's putting it under 1. That's it. And a lot of students make this so much harder than it is. If you are ever stuck, pick an x, plug it into the original, see what you get for a y value, and then take the reciprocal of that y value. Now, there's some pretty important things we notice happening in this table, and there's really, really three key points. This guy right here, I'm going to write that as IP. That's an invariant point, and we can see it on the graph. It's right here that that point is on the blue line and the red line. It's invariant because it exists on both of these functions. There's another invariant point all the way down here at one comma one. And it is a valuable, valuable thing to recognize that the reciprocal of one is one and the reciprocal of negative one is negative one. Now, what that means is that if we put an X value into our function and we get a Y value of one or negative one, the reciprocal does nothing. It keeps that point exactly where it is, and so we call it invariant. The other, and I shouldn't say point, because it's not really a point. Well, it is on the original. Um, 0, 0 is on the original curve. And I, I just want to show again that if 0, 0 is on f of x, that means that 0, 1 over 0 is on the reciprocal. This is a problem. You cannot divide by 0. And if you take a look at that red graph, it doesn't exist along, and black is not a good choice for that color. I'm going to draw a dotted green line here. And that's something that we call a vertical asymptote. Because as the x values of the red line here approach that green line, it veers off to negative or positive infinity. Now, the reason that's happening is that as my blue function, and it's these points right here, as my x value gets closer and closer to 0, my y value gets closer and closer to 0. Right? So this is approaching 0. Look at what happens on the reciprocal. When my y value is negative one half on my original, it's negative two on the reciprocal. When it's negative one fifth, it's negative five. Negative one tenth gives me negative 10. The closer my y value is to zero, the larger the value the reciprocal has. And that's a weird, almost kind of, it seems a little bit illogical to a lot of students, but because we are putting that value under one, when we divide one by a smaller and smaller number, we increase the value of that fraction. What happens on the graph is that my red line um, kind of veers away from that point because it cannot exist right here when y is equal to zero. And we call that a vertical asymptote. Now, there is some terminology involved in this chapter. I'm just going to do a couple of these reveals here. Um, y equals x is a linear function that the degree is 1. y equals 1 over x is a rational function. Now, chapter 6 was rational functions. And we talked about non-permissible values, but we really didn't attach that vertical asymptote meaning to it. You are going to spend a lot more time in Math 30 talking about that. Um, we are going to talk about them here. You will have to remember that vertical asymptotes occur when we would divide by zero in our reciprocal function. Um, horizontal asymptotes are values, y values, that the reciprocal approaches but never actually hits. We will get into that in far more detail in Math 30, though.
Now it does want us to talk about some of the properties of the function. I do apologize that this writing is a little bit small, but uh, you know, in the past students have been able to see it. Uh, a couple really important things um, is the domain and range. Now, when we talk about our function, f of x is equal to x, this is good to go. No value of x is gonna cause me to divide by zero or take the square root of a negative. But when I look at the reciprocal, I get one over x. This denominator having a variable is a problem because you cannot divide by zero. And that's where the restriction on our domain comes from. Now the restriction on the range is the concept that if I divide one by any number possible, I am never gonna get zero. Now you can think of the largest number, you know, 100 trillion, which maybe if it's the largest number you can think of, we need more imagination. But if I put in 100 trillion, I would have one over 100 trillion. That's not zero. It's very, very close, but you cannot divide one and get zero. And, and, and the only number you can divide by anything and get zero is zero, but that's not gonna come up in this lesson, so we're not gonna worry about it. A couple other important characteristics are something we call end behavior, which is what happens on the extreme right or extreme left of the graph. Um, if we look at f of x equals x, the end behavior is that as x gets very large, the y value goes to infinity. And on the other side, as x becomes very large in the negative direction, my y value goes to negative infinity. If you look at the reciprocal graph, it doesn't do that. And it's very important that that basic nature of the graph is shifted. If we look at the reciprocal, as the value of x gets very, very large, y approaches zero. Now, it never actually is zero, but it approaches zero. And I know that's just a little bit of a weird concept, but um, honestly, you get much more into it in calculus, which is not all that relevant for this course. The other piece or side, I suppose, of that rational shows the same thing happening. Now, the end behavior is not the tough part. The behavior near this dotted red line is the issue. That as my x value approaches zero, my rational goes up to positive infinity on the right-hand side and negative infinity on the left hand side and the reason for that is as we divide numbers that are closer and closer to zero or as we divide one by numbers that are closer to zero the value of that fraction goes up so my graph takes on that weird and we often call it a kind of rational behavior all right um the last couple columns here are the behavior at x equals zero well y is zero but one over zero is undefined and that's how we know where our vertical asymptote is. And we're gonna exploit that, that when f of x is equal to zero, one over f of x has a vertical asymptote. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the next examples. And then the last one is the invariant points. Invariant points, and this is nice, is good and consistent, always occur when f of x is equal to positive or negative one. One misconception, and it's unfortunate we pick such a simple function, that the next example will deal with it, is that it's not about x being positive or negative one, it's about the value of the function evaluated at some x. Now, we have to figure out what the x is. For this question, it was negative one and positive one, respectively, that's not a problem. But as the functions get more complex, you are going to have to make this in two stages, because you can't solve for positive and negative one, and that's gonna allow you to solve for the invariant points. Those are very important on these graphs, and most questions at some point will ask you to find invariant points, um, including some of the questions coming up in the example.